Story, Trial of the Century PTI Chapter 1 Washington, D.C., the man code name Mr. Adam took the news of success lightly. The Wakandans had walked right into his trap and given up their entire spy network in the United States. Or so Adam had hoped. In reality, the system that Dr. Henry Pym had developed for Adam merely found the signals that the Wakandan spy androids and data miners used and it was unable to decipher the codes. The Wakandans had no choice other than to shut down the network. Adam left his base of operations on Chancellor Street and drove to the Secretary of Defense sub-office. He passed Indiana Drive and spotted a television news van that was presumably on its way to the Superior Court for the beginning of the Shuri murder trial. Further on, Mr. Adam passed the scene of the crime West Shore Lane. It was alleged that Shuri opened fire on the CEO of Black Waters as he traveled in his limousine, killing the man and injuring another passenger. When Adam arrived at the sub-office, he carried the overcast morning inside with his grim face and uncaring attitude. The lone secretary was scared of him. She had every right to be. Adam was a former Navy SEAL and had led a kill squad in Afghanistan. He was never married women found that he was too cold to settle down with. The secretary didn't ask Adam any questions. She called the person in the head office over the intercom. You can go in, said the secretary. Adam barely acknowledged that he had been spoken to. He then entered the office and reported to his superior. The Wakandan Embassy, Washington, D.C., the lawyers Matthew Murdoch a.k.a. the Daredevil the Man Without Fear and Jennifer Walters a.k.a. She-Hulk went over the plan of defense with Shuri, T'Challa, and Ororo. Claw is their main witness, said Murdoch. He states that he knows Shuri's unique human frequency and that it was there at the time of the murder. Still that wouldn't hold up in court because he didn't actually see Shuri, nobody saw the face of the killer, said Ororo. She had blue eyes and creamy white long hair. Her mutant manipulation of elements and forces of the weather made her one of the most powerful superhumans. Exactly, said Jennifer Walters. And the laws regarding evidence in the District of Columbia do not state that a superhuman ability can be used as evidence or justification to convict a person. Thank God, said Shuri. She was a young woman with chestnut brown eyes and a medium haircut. Then there is the issue of Black Waters knowing that it was Silver Sable who killed their CEO. That is the only reason I see for someone over there sending the Mistek soldier to kill her, said T'Challa. You still have no proof that it was indeed a representative of Black Waters who sent the Mistek soldier, said Jennifer. Furthermore, all the evidence that Sable killed the CEO was presumably destroyed in the castle. Unless Silver Sable wakes from the coma and confesses her role in this trial is minimal. Either way, us and whoever authorized the Mistek soldier are withholding vital evidence and obstructing justice, said Murdoch. He was blind, but his other senses were heightened. Jennifer and I could lose our licenses if that was known. I'm sorry you got dragged into this, said Shuri. Both of you wouldn't be here if not for your friendship with T'Challa and Ororo. True, said Jennifer bluntly. We are here now though and we will do our damned best to get you acquitted. Who is the prosecutor? asked Ororo. David Stagler, replied Murdoch. He has made 22 convictions in all high-profile cases. With a reputation like that it seems strange that he will take on a flimsy case like this, said T'Challa. He was 35 years old, and he was considered to be one of the most dangerous men in the world. That is what worries me, said Jennifer. Now T'Challa after I've finished cross-examine Rhodes I will put you on the stand. I want you to state the condition Shuri was in when you met her on the night in question, said Murdoch. No problem, said T'Challa. Does he really have to be involved, asked Shuri. A stunned Jennifer looked at her and said, of course, he is key to your alibi. 
Is there some friction going on between you two, asked Murdoch, because to win this case will take a united front. Just a difference of opinion on the degree of involvement of Ororo and me, said Tichala. Ororo turned to Jennifer. What about the judge? she asked. Judge Randolph is respected and known to be fair, replied Jennifer. In terms of the opening and closing statements, Jennifer will start things off and I will make the closing statement. Please remember that only the members of the jury need convincing. They can only make a decision based on the evidence given, said Murdoch. And you are positively sure that the law state that Claw's testimony will not be admissible, asked Tichella. Because I don't like relying on one point to hold up the defense. The law clearly states it, said Murdoch, and he tapped on the suitcase that held his documents. Remember when you are on the stand just answer simple yes or no. There is no room for emotional responses. Only elaborate when asked, said Jennifer. This trial will be won by whoever gives the best argument based on the evidence. Justice has nothing to do with it, added Murdoch. That justice is so unattainable was the reason Sable told Tichala and me that she had murdered Crosskill, said Ororo. Just remember that Crosskill's crimes are not on trial, said Jennifer. She was the cousin of Bruce Banner aka Hulk. She had received the gamma mutation through a blood transfusion from Banner and it allowed her to turn into a super strong green humanoid. Jenny and I managed to get a balanced jury, said Murdoch. Why do I still not feel assured, said Shuri. Just relax, said Jennifer. I have won cases in intergalactic tribunals and Matt has a proven track record of winning. Still I'm a foreigner accused of killing a US citizen on American soil. There is bound to be resentment in that jury, said Shuri. I know there would be if the situation was reverse and we were in Wakanda. Be that as it may, the jury must decide based on the evidence despite their personal convictions, said Murdoch. The things I must go through just to honor another warrior, said Shuri. Sable was working on a way of getting you off the charge, said Ororo. She could have worked faster, said Shuri. Chapter 2 The Wakandans and their lawyers waded through the media circus that was on the west side of the court building. Tichala and Ororo were ushered to seats in the gallery while Shuri, Murdoch, and Jennifer sat at the defendant's table. They met James War Machine Rhodes as he came in. The state prosecutor entered the chambers with his assistant and they sat at the prosecutor's table. Ulysses Claw sat directly behind them in the gallery. He was next to the new chairman of Black Waters. The court reporter was ready to type out the discourse. The jury box was on the right side of the courtroom. A long case was next to the prosecution's side. A widescreen television was on the left side at an angle for the entire court to see the screen. A sense of high anticipation was in the gallery that consisted mostly of journalists. Judge Randolph entered the chamber and everyone stood. The judge sat and then everyone took their seats. The courtroom deputy read out the charges. Good morning. Let's proceed with the opening statements, said Randolph. Jennifer rose and she went directly to the jury. Good morning members of the jury. Today a young woman is accused of a very serious crime, that of the murder of David Cross Skill. My colleague Mr. Murdoch and I will show that Shuri did not murder David Crosskill and instead that she is the victim of the state looking for a scapegoat for a crime they could not otherwise solve. Shuri has a distinguished record for putting herself in harm's way to protect the people of Earth. She had no previous charges in any U.S. federal court. Shuri came for this trial on her own free will to clear her name. Does that evoke a bloodthirsty individual as the state has presented Shuri? We have a duty to protect innocent people from judicial witch hunts. We would not want our loved ones placed in a similar position where their characters are tarnished because of being wrongly accused. The facts will show that Shuri was in her native country Wakanda at the time of the murder. 
miles away from the District of Columbia. It should also be noted that Shuri is a sister of and sister-in-law of two heads of states. She has also acted as head of state in her country. She is no stranger to great responsibility and knowing the severity of making the wrong decision. Honor is a strong tradition in Wakanda as it is here in America, Shuri is an honorable woman and for her to murder a US citizen just a few streets away from the White House would have been a dishonorable act. Honor will be one of the themes that will come up in this trial. Shuri's honor to her code and to her brother, T'Challa the leader of Wakanda. The state would like you to believe that David Crosskill was singled out by Shuri for punishment. The fact of the matter is that David Crosskill was not even on Shuri's radar. She did not even know the man. She only became aware of him when she was charged for the crime. The means of which Shuri was singled out for the crime is also a cause for concern. This is a clear case of mistaken identity. Therefore the defense will prove that Shuri had no motive for the murder, that she didn't order the murder and that she didn't commit the murder. Thank you, said Jennifer. Stagler buttoned his jacket and slowly walked over to the jury stand. He rested his hand on the front panel. Good morning. David Crosskill was a hard-working American who as chairman oversaw the expansion of America's foremost defense contractor Blackwater's military science company. He was murdered because he upset a known tempestuous woman. That woman right there, said Stagler, and he pointed at Shuri. She stared back at him intently. The adrenaline in his body nullified the sudden fear that erupted in him. He turned back to the jury and made direct eye contact with most of them. It has been seen that Shuri murdered an insurrection leader without due process in her country Wakanda, on live television in front of millions, and she came over here in the US and committed the same act. Why? David Crosskill resurrected Ulysses Claw, said Stagler, and he pointed out Claw in the gallery. Now Mr. Claw is a unique individual as well as a trusted employee at Blackwaters as we will learn later, what is important now is that a previous version of Claw assassinated Shuri's father. On the night in question, Shuri was confronted at a Blackwaters facility. Investigations that followed revealed that Claw's stored DNA was destroyed. Due to a legal loophole Shuri was not charged for that crime even though she confessed point-blank to the investigating FBI officer. The state will prove based on the evidence that Shuri is a vindictive woman who wants Claw dead and anyone responsible for his resurrection. The main person who protected Claw and resurrected him at the time was David Cross Skill. I don't know Wakanda's legal system but in the United States of America ex-judicial killings are against the law said Stagler, and the state is asking you for the maximum sentence of life imprisonment for the crime committed by this dangerous woman. He then returned to his chair. Murdoch stood and addressed the judge. I will now call my first witness Colonel James Rhodes, he said. The colonel stepped out of the gallery and he was escorted by the courtroom deputy to the witness stand. At the time, Murdoch paced the floor. Mr. Rhodes can you inform the court of your role in the military, said Murdoch. Actually I have several roles. Could you state the role you were in on the night in question, asked Murdoch. I was on patrol of military facilities in my war machine role. Did you meet the defendant that night? Yes, replied Rhodes. Kindly tell the court what happened, said Murdoch. I encountered Shuri at a Blackwaters research facility. She was in an invisible camouflage mode but I was able to spot her. We engaged in a fight as she tried to get away, said Rhodes. After the fight ended, in what condition was Shuri? Badly beaten up. She had battle amour but it was no match for mine, replied Rhodes. Thank you Mr. Rhodes I have no more questions, said Murdoch. Mr. Stagler do you have any questions for the witness, asked Randolph. Yes your honor, said Stagler. He stood quickly and stared at the jury and then the witness. 
Mr. Rhodes, said Stagler as he returned to his desk for a document. I have a signed statement from you that refutes what you just told the court. There was a murmur from the gallery. Stagler continued, you state here that the intruder was unknown to you. What do you have to say about that? I made the statement directly after the altercation some of the facts were still fuzzy, replied Rhodes. Okay. But Shuri confessed to the investigating FBI officer that you knew who she was before and during the battle. So the court is to conclude that the truth is something that you take very lightly. Jennifer was quickly on her feet, objection your honor, the prosecution is bringing insinuation into the matter. Randolph agreed and said, sustained. Mr. Stagler can you please be more direct? Sorry your honor, said Stagler, and he eyed Rhodes. You deliberately left out information to protect the sister of your friend Tichala due to a debt you owe to him for saving your life in an incident outside of the White House. Jennifer rose and said, Objection. The prosecution is further insinuating the thoughts and feelings of the witness. Randolph didn't agree on that occasion so he said, Objection denied. Stagler looked at the jury and then back to Rhodes. Rhodes you state that Shuri was in a bad condition when the battle was over, but the court will not know if your memory is still fuzzy from that night. I have no more questions, said Stagler. Very well, the defense may call their next witness, said Judge Randolph. Rhodes politely left the witness box. The defense calls Tichala to the stand, said Murdoch. Suddenly Tichala and Ororo's Kimoyo's silently vibrated Silver Sable's father was calling them. I'll take it outside, whispered Ororo. All right, said Tichala. As he made his way to the witness stand Ororo exited the courtroom. She ran into a barrage for reporters and photographers. She spotted Peter Parker aka Spider-Man in the scrum that was created as the reporters all rushed in. The court guards shielded her as she went to the south entrance. She exited and summoned a wind current that took her over the street and landed her next to the Wakandan limousine. Ernest Sablanova was Silver Sable's father and the Nazi hunter was not pleased that his daughter had been kept in Wakanda for such a long period. You cannot take her now she still needs our protection, said Ororo. From what? You have yet to tell her family who attacked her and destroyed the castle, said Sablanova. It would only complicate matters further if we told you what happened, said Ororo. I want my daughter back, today, said Sablanova, the de facto leader of a small Balkan country. That's not possible, said Ororo. Ororo I will enter Wakanda myself and free my daughter, said Sablanova. There is no need for that, said Ororo. Tichala and I are in Washington D.C. I know about the trial then you know that we are tied up right now, hopefully tomorrow we will be back in Wakanda and we can settle this issue, said Ororo. Twenty-four hours, that what you're asking for? In a way, yes, replied Ororo. Okay, I'll be holding you to your word, said Sablanova. I wouldn't expect anything less, said Ororo. The chauffeur called on the intercom. He addressed her formally and said, please look at the security cameras. Thanks, said Ororo. She voice activated the security system and a holographic panel appeared in front of her. On the display she saw Luke Cage and Juggernaut. What do they want, she murmured. Ororo alighted from the limousine. She knew Luke Cage and Kane Juggernaut Marco. Cage had the gift of impenetrable skin and superhuman strength. Kane was the avatar for a mystical force that granted him Hulk-level strength and invulnerability. The last Ororo had heard about the two was that they worked in the US government criminal rehabilitation program called the Thunderbolts, of which Cage was the leader. Is anything wrong Storm? asked Cage. No, replied Ororo. You wouldn't be planning to spring your sister-in-law before the trial ends, 
asked Juggernaut. Ororo stared at the ten-foot-tall behemoth. He wore a helmet that shielded him from his stepbrother's telepathy. The brother was Professor X, the creator of the X-Men and Ororo's mentor. Ororo ignored the question and she focused on Cage. Why are you here? she asked. Cage hesitated a bit and then answered, the Thunderbolts have been ordered to take Shuri to the Raft prison if she is convicted. That's a tad extreme don't you think? asked Ororo. I'm just following orders, said Cage. Sure you are, said Ororo. Hey you don't have to come down so hard on the boss man, said Juggernaut. Ororo gave him a stare that cut through his bravado. She was also a bit surprised by Marco's protection of Cage. Juggernaut had been a long-time foe of the X-Men. Ororo had even fought him in one-on-one -on -one combat. In recent times it looked like he had turned for the better, but that didn't last long. Ororo pitted Cage. He was a good soul and a genuine hero. She couldn't imagine the pain he felt in having to deal with the likes of Juggernaut and the other psychopathic killers on the Thunderbolts team when he could be with his wife and child. Some of the media had spotted the meeting so they crossed the street. Look, I have to go, said Ororo. Take care Ororo, said Cage. Tell Jennifer hello for me. She got me out of a bind with the law once, said Juggernaut. Ororo mentally manipulated the surrounding elements and she formed a strong thermal wind current that lifted her into the sky. Then she returned to the court. Her thoughts were on T'Challa's cross-examination that she had missed. Chapter 3 T'Challa settled in the witness stand and waited for Murdoch's questions. The Black Panther swept the courtroom with his eyes. He took in the tense and serious atmosphere. The court reporter had her finger primed over the stenotype machine. In a way the nature of the court reminded T'Challa of a chess match. He glanced at Stagler and saw that the man watched him with the focus of a chess master. T'Challa what is your connection to the defendant? asked Murdoch. I'm her brother, said T'Challa. Did you speak to your sister on the night in question? Yes. At what time? 10 p.m. Are you sure? Yes. How can you be? I kept looking at the time because I was waiting to speak to her, replied T'Challa. And what was the conversation about? Laying off of Claw, responded T'Challa. Murdoch turned to the jury, and he spoke, so the court has heard that you told Shuri not to go after Claw in any way. Is that correct? Yes, replied T'Challa. Did Shuri agree to your demand? Yes she did. In general does Shuri heed your words, asked Murdoch. Yes, replied T'Challa. Also what was Shuri's physical condition at the time of the conversation? She came directly from the battle with Rhodes so she was in a bad shape, replied T'Challa. And after the conversation what happened? We had spoken in our father's crypt and I left her there. Did you ask Shuri if she committed the murder? Yes. What was her answer? She said no. Do you believe her? Yes, replied T'Challa. No further questions your honor, said Murdoch, and he took his seat. The judge turned the witness over to Stagler. The vintage lawyer closed another document in front of him and he rose. He walked slowly towards the witness stand. Good morning Excellency. It is not every day that I get to cross-examine a head of state. Could you state your connection to the defendant? asked Stagler. She is my sister, replied T'Challa. Actually, said Stagler, and he raised a pointed hand, she is your half-sister. Your mother died during your birth and your father remarried. Then he was assassinated and your stepmother raised you and Shuri. Is that correct? T'Challa moved slightly and said, Yes. Are you are a close family? Relatively speaking, yes we are a close family. 
Stagler turned to the jury. Excellency would you do anything for your sister, asked Stagler. Tichala saw where the questions were going. It depends, he said. Did you and Shuri speak alone in the crypt? Yes. Stagler turned back to Tichala. I understand that you are a brilliant man. You were a prestigious physics professor and gave lectures at various international universities. But recent events have dampened your credibility. I'm talking about the Soberg incident, said Stagler. Murdoch was quickly on his feet, and he said, Objection Your Honor, the prosecution is bringing in matters that don't pertain to the case. Stagler faced Judge Randolph and the lawyer said, I'm trying to get the character of the witness. The objection is overruled and Stagler please hurry up, said Randolph. Thank you, said Stagler. Excellency Tichala, it has been reported that you and your wife kidnapped and imprisoned the head of state of Aranzi and placed a clone of the elected president of that country in the place of the original. President Dr. Soberk is much like you in a way, he has a wealthy country and is a hero to the world. He can be said to be your equal. You and your wife deceived the world and here now you speak about telling Shuri to lay off of Mr. Claw. No one else was present to collaborate this testimony. Tichala couldn't say anything in his defense. Stagler looked at the jury and then he returned to his table. I'm finished with the witness he said. Shuri leaned over to Murdoch and whispered, that didn't go well. We'll have to wait and see. You're up next, said Murdoch. Jennifer rose and called Shuri as the next witness. The young woman left the defense table and went to the witness stand. Jennifer walked to the center of the floor of the stage as some of lawyers called it. She stood at an angle where she had a view of the jury and Shuri. Shuri did you know David Crosskill, asked Jennifer. No you are accused of intentionally killing him. Did you kill him? Aurora's return to the courtroom distracted Shuri for a second. No, Shuri finally replied. What happened after Tichala left you at the crypt, asked Jennifer. I remained there. I reflected on what he had asked of me. Then I went home. Did you stay at home? Yes. Were you alone? Yes. Do you own a high-powered assault rifle? No why not? Because it is not my weapon of choice. What is your weapon of choice for the Corps to know? asked Jennifer. A mini sonic cannon. Jennifer gave a surprised expression, and then continued. David Crosskill was murdered by bullets that came from a high-powered rifle. FBI Ballistics has confirmed this. If you did want to murder Crosskill how would you have done it? asked Jennifer. Stagler paused in his note-taking and he leaned back. It would have been up close and personal, replied Shuri. Because that is the level of your training. That is correct, replied Shuri. Why did you heed Tichala's request to stop pursuing Claw? I trust my brother's wisdom, replied Shuri. You wanted to honor your brother's wishes, asked Jennifer. Yes, replied Shuri. Let's discuss your injuries at time. What were they? I had sore muscles, cuts, bruises and my left arm was slightly dislocated, replied Shuri. Did a doctor treat you? No, the wounds were treated by me at home. How long did that take? About two hours. Then I slept to recuperate. How long did you sleep for? Until the morning, answered Shuri. Jennifer slowly walked towards the jury while she spoke, the FBI investigation into the case stated that explosives were detonated under the vehicle that David Crosskill traveled in and that a masked female shooter fired into the limousine. I want to show the jury the city surveillance footage of the shooter. Jennifer went to the defense table and Murdoch handed her a compact disc. She placed the disc into the television. The footage came on and it showed a shooter firing from a rooftop. 
The shooter then ran from the scene and nimbly leapt from the roof onto the adjacent building and disappeared from the sight of the camera. As the court can see, the shooter is masked and fit enough to leap from one building to next without visible signs of stress, said Jennifer. Crosskill was murdered but it was not done by Shuri. I have no further questions your honor. Stagler was on the floor in seconds. David Crosskill was murdered at approximately 4.00 m based on the autopsy report, he said, presumably you were asleep at that time. Are you asking me a question, inquired Shuri. Stagler was not amused and he said, yes. Were you asleep at that time? Yes, replied Shuri. Yup, said Stagler. The defense wants to give the impression that you were too hurt from the battle with Rhodes to launch an attack on Cross Skill. But isn't Wakanda ahead of the world in medical care? Even Cuba is a step behind. Tell us the truth Shuri. You left the crypt, fixed up your wounds and came back to the States to shoot Cross Skill. That is a lie, said Shuri. Stagler was not flustered. What is your rank in Wakanda's military, he asked. I'm the commander of the commando unit. Do you have access to military surveillance? Jennifer objected to the line of questioning because it dealt with Wakanda's national defense. Okay I will reword my question. Could you monitor David Crosskill's vehicle remotely, asked Stagler. Yes, replied Shuri, knowing she was being trapped in a corner. I understand that Wakanda has teleportation devices that a high-ranking person such as you can have access to. So you monitored Crosskill and knew when to strike, said Stagler. No, said Shuri vehemently. She noticed that Jennifer and Murdoch were whispering, most likely due to the heat of her reply. Stagler went to his desk and spoke to his assistant. The assistant slid the case from the side of the table. Stagler opened it and took out an assault rifle. He presented it to the jury. Based on the ballistics, it was a rifle like this that took Crosskill's life, said Stagler. Now Shuri stated that a mini sonic wave cannon was her weapon of choice, well obviously she wouldn't use it to murder Crosskill because everyone would know that she did it, so she used this. She had six hours in which to plan and execute. She has no credible alibi. Shuri gripped her seat to avoid an outburst. Stagler gave the rifle to the assistant. I have no further questions, said Stagler. You can step down Shuri, said Randolph. Does the defense have any more witnesses? We have no more for today, responded Jennifer. Does the prosecution have any witnesses, asked Randolph. Stagler stood and said, we will like to call Dr. Ulysses Claw to the witness stand. Jennifer gathered her copy of the Evidence Act. Chapter 4 Claw wanted Shuri locked away for good because he believed that she would pursue him for the rest of his life. He figured the court case would be the best opportunity to achieve his goal. He merely had to lie about Shuri being at the scene of the crime. The lie would have to be something that was extremely difficult to prove false. Claw settled in the witness stand and waited for Stagler. For the benefit of the court state your occupation, said Stagler. I'm the chief scientist and division manager of the A Charter Division of Blackwater's Military Science Company, said Claw. Do you enjoy your work? Immensely. How did you come to work for the company, asked Stagler. I was cloned from the DNA of a previous incarnation of me. My memories of the previous lives were wiped from my mind. I was given a new human body. Is the study of sound your area of expertise? Yes. But there's more to it than that, I can generate sound waves, manipulate them and I can sense the unique vibrations that each human makes. Stagler watched the jury. In your new form have you ever met Shuri? I met her several months ago. The G12 nations sent her, T'Challa and Storm to a planet I was on. 
What happened on the planet? Storm attacked me and then Tichala, replied Claw, and he looked at the defense table. How did you survive? I have accelerated healing abilities, replied Claw. Kindly tell the court what transpired at the time of the attack on you and David Cross Skill. Cross Skill had picked me up from the DC City Lab and we were discussing business when our limousine was turned over by an explosion. We were shot repeatedly. Before I blanked out, I sensed Shuri's unique human frequency, said Claw. Placing her at the scene of the crime, said Stagler satisfactorily. Both Jennifer and Murdoch stood. Your Honor based on the logbooks the use of superhuman abilities is not admissible as evidence in the District of Columbia. I ask for Claw's testimony to be stricken from the records, said Murdoch. Hold on, said Stagler. He walked over to his assistant and received a document. The law was amended to allow for superhuman evidence, said Stagler. Let me see that, said Randolph. In fact, both the defense and prosecution approached the bench. The lawyers complied and Randolph took Stagler's document. Your Honor the amendment was made via the Specialty Legislation Act said Stagler. Even so, laws passed by the act only last for 90 days, said Randolph. But there is a clause in that act that states if the amendments warrant immediate action then they can be put through on the Intelligentsia Act, said Stagler. I see, said Randolph as he read the document, and this amendment was signed by the President last night. Yes your honor, said Stagler. Claw's testimony must be kept in the records. I also have four independent tests that verify Claw's abilities to detect human frequencies. Jennifer and Murdoch panicked. Your Honor, the defense would like a stay of trial until we can examine the amendment, said Jennifer. Preferably we can come back tomorrow, said Murdoch. Randolph looked at Stagler. What do you say, the judge asked. Fine by me, but the law clearly states what has to be done, replied Stagler. Okay then, return to your tables, said Randolph, and he looked over to Claw. You can leave the witness stand. Claw obeyed while the lawyers went to their tables. Shuri turned to Jennifer. What's going on? Shuri asked. Big trouble, was the dry reply. The gallery had turned into a sea of murmurs. Randolph slammed his mallet for silence to return to the courtroom. I'm ordering a stay of trial until tomorrow so the defense can go over the amendment in the law. The trial will resume at 9.00 am, said Randolph. He slammed his gavel and then rose. Chapter 5 The Wakandan limousine pulled out of the avenue and headed for the embassy. Tichala, Ororo, Shuri and their lawyers discussed the trial on the journey. What is the Intelligentsia Act? asked Shuri. Intelligentsia was a criminal group that had attacked Washington, D.C. The attack came swiftly after another one was staged a few months before. The lawmakers realized that urgent legislation needed to bypass the Congress, the Senate and various overseeing bodies. Laws and amendments needed to signed quickly by the President thus they created the Intelligentsia Act, replied Jennifer. So President Bowlinger allowed this amendment to go through last night, said Ororo. We weren't aware of it, said Murdoch. It was deliberately done last night in my estimation, said Tichala. What now? Shuri asked. We will take on Claw's testimony and prove that he is not telling the truth, said Jennifer. Appealing the amendment is another route, on the grounds that there are no serious conditions that warrant such lack of due process, said Murdoch. What about pressuring Black Waters to reveal what they know? Ororo asked. We can put the new chairman on the stand and see what he knows, replied Jennifer. Or better yet, put the Mistek soldier on the stand, said Ororo. He seemed sentient when I last fought him. 
he is a military weapon most likely handling sensitive operations, the government will not easily place him in the court, said Murdoch. Can't we use a recording? asked Ororo. I will have to double check, said Murdoch. Also Sable's father wants her returned to their country. I was able to delay it for 24 hours, said Ororo. Eventually we will have to tell him the truth, said Shuri. Tichala noticed that she had a glum appearance. He decided that a private chat with her would suffice to find out the reason for her mood. The Wakandan Embassy, the conference room, Tichala and Aurora went over the disabled spy network situation in private. From all checks, Wakanda's entire United States covered information gathering system was compromised. Right now, all the spy bots and androids are on standby mode, that makes us practically blind in this country, said Aurora. Tichala had a considerable decision that weighed on his mind. In order to find the Mistek soldier we need to reactivate the spy network. Then the US will definitely be able to identify all our assets, said Tichala. You're going to do it, aren't you? Tichala had his elbows on the conference table and he held his head with his right hand. I spent a lot of years building this spy network and in a matter of seconds it will be torn down. I will do that just for my sister not to spend the rest of her life in prison, said Tichala. You should tell Shuri beforehand. I can see that the trial is having a negative effect on her, said Ororo. I noticed it too. Speaking of the trial, how did you perform on the witness stand, asked Ororo. It was terrible. I knew exactly where Stagler was leading me and I couldn't stop it. I was surprised that he knew so much about us, said Ororo. He must have culled all the government agencies for intelligence on us, said Tichala. Jennifer and Murdoch worked hard to convince the jury. Honestly speaking I think the jury will take a great deal of time to reach a unanimous decision because the arguments are so close, said Ororo. Also President Bollinger's involvement worries me, said Tichala. He may genuinely see the both of us as problems, said Ororo. We really have to speak with him. I don't see us speaking on friendly terms in the near future, said Tichala. Ororo looked at the time. Okay I'll locate the Mistek soldier while you speak with Shuri, she said. All right, honey, said Tichala. They kissed and then Ororo left. Tichala remained in the conference room and thought about the future. Eventually he left in search of Shuri. He found his sister in her room. At the time, Shuri spoke with their mother over the video phone. Tichala just came in, said Shuri. Good evening mother, said Tichala. Ramonda had traces of tears in her eyes. Tichala understood that even though mother and daughter often didn't see eye to eye that they still loved each other. Good evening dear, said Ramonda. Shuri says that we have hit a snag. Yes mother, said Tichala. That's what I have come to talk to Shuri about. Don't let me keep you back. I want this burden lifted off of us as soon as possible and the people are behind you on this matter, said Ramonda. Thanks mother, said Tichala. Shuri call me back when you can, said Ramonda. Yes mother, said Shuri. The video phone went blank, and Shuri walked over to the window. Tichala went directly to the reason for him being there. We are going to use the spy network one last time in order to find the Mistek soldier, said Tichala. You don't have to do that, said Shuri and she rubbed her forehead as though a serious headache had overtaken her. It is the best option we have left, said Tichala. What is going on in that head of yours? Shuri sucked her teeth and turned to him. This is my entire fault. We shouldn't be here. You and Ororo should be governing. I feel like I'm 14 again and you having to come and bail me out a problem that I got myself into, said Shuri. 
I'm a grown woman. I should fight my own battles and not rely on you and Ororo. Tichala stared at her and he agreed that the situation had a sense of deja vu. It is your personality, said Tichala. You make rash decisions. Sometimes you are right and other times you are wrong. I love you and I will do what I can to help you I think that I should be grateful and still I would rather that you do nothing, said Shuri. Fair enough, the next time you are in trouble I will not help unless you ask for it, said Tichala. You really think that we can win the case? Shuri asked. Of course. How about you? I don't know. Matt and Jennifer are giving their all still I look at the jury and I can tell that they aren't buying it, replied Shuri. It is odd really having your life in the hands of those people. If you are convicted then we'll appeal, said Tichala. If that fails then what? I will not spend the rest of my life in prison for a crime I didn't commit, said Shuri, and her voice picked up at the end of her sentence. You plan on running? If needs be, said Shuri. Okay, said T. Chella. His kamoyo beeped after it had collected a message from Ororo. The Mistek soldier had been located. We found him, said T. Chella. All right. Be careful, said Shuri. I'll speak with Matt and Jennifer on ways of proving that Claw is lying. T. Chella kissed her forehead and she hugged him. Then he left. Urgiskston, ten minutes later, Tichala and Ororo teleport via the time-space computers on the Black Panther's sword. The couple appeared in the raised remains of a terrorist camp. As planned, Ororo concentrated on the formation of thick clouds to block the US spy satellites and she created electrical storms around the area to disrupt communications between the Mistek soldier and its controllers. Tichala sniffed the smoky air and his hypersense of smell filtered through the sense until he found the prey. He's close by, said Tichala. The weather changed rapidly and soon Aurora's manipulation had taken hold of the night. Her eyes gleamed as she used her mutant abilities. The silver Mistek soldier emerged out of the darkness. His sleek armor was made from Asgardian metal and he was powered by both technology and magic. We want to talk, said Tichala. The Mistek soldier powered up his optical beams and he fired at the Black Panther and Storm. Story, Trial of the Century PT2 Chapter 1 The Wakanda Embassy, Washington DC, 10 minutes ago, the idea came to Aurora while she oversaw the deactivation of the Wakandan spy network in the United States. When Tichala entered the covered operations room, Ororo pulled him aside. We can let the US government force Black Waters to show their hand, said Ororo, who was a slender woman with blue eyes and long white hair. How? asked T. Chella. By using the tagger on the Mistek soldier, we will merely ask him about his attack on Silver Sable and then we'll leave. When he speaks with his controllers in Black Waters, the tagger will broadcast their conversations to America's counterintelligence unit. The tagger's line would be the only one opened for them to hear. But then we will be giving up Sable, said Tichella. I have a solution for that, Ororo said, and then she told him the plan. All right, let's give it go, said Tichella. He then informed Shuri, Matthew Murdoch, and Jennifer Walters about Ororo's plan. Aurora went to the vault and returned with the ultra nano robot listening device called the Tagger. She programmed the device for the keywords that it should look out for. Her pickpocket skills were needed to place the Tagger on the Mistek soldier. Presently, Erk Giston, when Alexander the Great led his army towards India, he cut a bloody part through Central Asia. It was only fitting that the site for one of Alexander's biggest battles was presently used for Tichala and Ororo's confrontation with the Mistek soldier. The couple did their best to avoid harming the American weapon despite him trying to capture them. 
Aurora was frustrated that she couldn't place the tagger on the Mystic soldier because he quantum shifted any part of his anatomy that was vulnerable. Aurora also had to deal with the telepathic probes the Mystic soldier attempted on her, and she could only guess that the same was tried on Tichala. Aurora's weather manipulation had created a great electrical storm around the battle and it kept out the Mystic soldier's controllers. This is taking too long eventually his handlers will find a way in, thought Aurora. She again tried radiation and magnetism on the Mystic soldier and they didn't work. Her mini tornadoes were also useless against the foe. He counter-attacked with optic rays and energy blasts from his hands. Tichala made pointless raids against the Mystic soldier as the Black Panther constantly missed the target despite his speed and acrobatics. Aurora heard her husband shout at the Mystic soldier. Who sent you to kill Silver Sable? asked Tichala. You don't have the authority to receive the answer, replied the Silver Machine. The night was pitch black, wet and cold. The remnants of the terrorist camp, that the Mystic soldier had destroyed, provided weapons and protection for Tichala and Aurora. A momentary lull occurred in fight as the Mystic soldier stood still with Storm in front of him and Tichala on his right flank. Aurora surmised the Mystic soldier would quantum shift his body to the left if Tichala leapt at him. She could fly at top speed to plant the tagger as the Mystic soldier reappeared. Storm whistled to Tichala and gave him a nod. Such was the chemistry between them that Tichala read the plan Aurora intended. Aurora inhaled deeply as Tichala charged into the opponent. In a flash Aurora used the magnetic force of the earth to catapult her to the vacant space at the side of the Mystic soldier. She held the tagger in her right hand. As the Mystic soldier quantum shifted it reappeared in front of Aurora and she attached the tagger. The Mystic soldier caught her by the shoulder. He was about to apply his Hulk-level strength when Tichala's sword teleported the Black Panther and Storm. Aurora saw the world dematerialize and she took comfort that soon they would be in the Wakanda Embassy. It did not happen. Aurora felt as though she had bounced off a wall and she reappeared in front of the Mystic soldier. The machine punched down fiercely at her and she dodged the blow. Then she skillfully somersaulted out of the Mystic soldier's reach. She felt like the teleportation was taking effect and then she disappeared. Storm and Tichala emerged in their home in Wakanda. There must be a teleportation barrier around the embassy, said Tichala, I had to teleport here instead. Aurora held her sore shoulder, a concerned Tichala checked on it. We have to get in contact with Shuri, said Aurora. Urkistan, the weather cleared the instant Aurora left the vicinity. The covert U.S. agency that controlled the Mystic soldier finally reached him. What happened? inquired the operations officer over a radio link. The Black Panther and Storm were here, replied the Mystic soldier. What did they want? They wanted to know why I tried to kill the Silver Sable. The operations officer was lost as he had never heard of the mission. Okay. Return to base, said the operations officer. Affirmative, said the Mystic soldier. The weapon flew into the upper atmosphere and headed for the United States. Thirty minutes later it was checked by the chief technician in a California military base. The technician was on contract from Black Waters. He had supervised the Mystic soldier for the attack on Silver Sable although he denied knowing anything about it when the operations officer had inquired. In low tones the technician spoke with the Mystic soldier. What did Black Panther and Storm tell you? asked the technician. They asked why I had attacked the Silver Sable. Did you tell them? No good then. Only the chairman of Black Waters has the authority to access that information from you, said the technician. Is that clear? Affirmative. You will tell everyone else that you never attacked the Silver Sable, said the technician. Affirmative, said the Mystic soldier. 
The tagger picked up on the keywords and it duplicated itself. The duplicate traveled like an airborne virus from the Mistech soldier to the technician. The scared technician then made a private call to Edward Nolan, the chairman of Black Waters and told him about the Mistech soldier. Nolan was unconcerned. The Black Panther and Storm may still not know that Silver Sable murdered Cross Skill, said Nolan. What happens if they do find out and come after us? We will cross that bridge when we come to it, said Nolan. The White House, two hours later, the Secretary of Defense played the tape of the technician's conversation for President Bowlinger. Blackwater employee Timothy Hathaway made the call and he spoke with Edward Nolan, the chairman of Blackwater's military science company, said the Secretary of Defense. Silver Sable is the leader of Simcaria, a tiny Balkan nation. Is the tape authentic? asked the president. He had believed that the aide came with new information on the Wakanda embassy lockdown. He was surprised that the matter had to do with the Shuri trial. We aren't 100% sure. It was broadcasted over the Wakandan frequency and it could be a form of trickery, replied the Secretary of Defense. Either way we are implicated in this now, said Bowlinger. I don't follow, said the Secretary of Defense. I'm speaking about the Shuri murder trial. Ulysses Claw testified that Shuri killed the old Blackwater CEO, but that seems to be untrue by Blackwater's own admission, said Bowlinger. He stared pensively at the desk for a moment. I need legal counsel on how to proceed, he said. Then he dialed the private number for the U.S. Attorney General. Chapter 2 The Wakandan Embassy Two hours and thirty minutes ago, you're guilty, said the judge in Shuri's mind and she heard the gavel slam onto the judge's desk. Shuri returned her focus to the logbooks that rested in front of her. They were heaped up like a hill. Matthew Murdoch and Jennifer Walters periodically took from the heap and added to it. Murdoch's assistant Froggy aided the blind lawyer. Jennifer also had an assistant who went by the name Jazin Da, she was a Skrull alien disguised as a woman. The silence ate away at Shuri's mind. She came to help her legal team and was enthusiastic about the exercise. However, she realized that her nuclear physics classes were livelier than the present company. She could also understand the reason Murdoch and Jennifer moonlighted as vigilantes as it was more exciting. Murdoch's alter ego was the daredevil. Despite the blindness, Murdoch had acuteness in his other senses and ninja training. On the other hand, Jennifer could transform into the She-Hulk, a wild and super strong individual. Shuri rubbed her right temple while her mind drifted away from reality again. This time she thought about her plan to flee the country if she was found guilty. There would be a political fallout that she didn't really care about, yet T'Challa and Aurora would have to mend it. That bothered her because Shuri didn't like her brother and sister-in-law cleaning up her messes. She would be in a no-win situation if the verdict went against her. Someone knocked on the door and Shuri said enter. The ambassador came in and she addressed Shuri. We have a situation. S.H.I.E.L.D and the Avengers have surrounded the embassy. This letter was dropped off by the front gate, said the ambassador. Shuri sensed that the woman forced herself to remain calm. The young woman took the letter and read it. Murdoch had heard the ambassador so he walked over to Shuri. What is it? he inquired. T'Challa and Aurora are banned from going anywhere in the U.S. other than to the court or the airport. The embassy will be placed on lockdown until the trial is over, replied Shuri. Why? asked Murdoch. What's going on over there? asked Jennifer. The embassy is on lockdown and so too are T'Challa and Aurora, replied Murdoch. For what reason? asked Jennifer. There are a few issues that are going on concurrent with the case and I think that is the reason. I can't tell you about the issues right now, said Shuri. Okay, 
said Jennifer. National security stuff, just carry on. Shuri didn't like the mock attitude. Don't sound like that, said Shuri. I don't want to distract you from your work and it is indeed Wakanda's national security stuff. I said okay already, said Jennifer. Shuri steered clear of a verbal altercation with Jennifer since they both were strong-headed individuals. Murdoch's mobile rang and he took the call. When he was done with the call, he turned his attention to Shuri. She looked directly at him. He wore thick shades. His hair was brown and he looked ruffled in his business shirt and trousers. S.H.I.E.L.D. Officers are raiding my apartment. They have a warrant to search the premises on grounds of aiding threats to national security, said Murdoch. Shuri had nothing to say. Jennifer called her neighbor and was told that military people were in her apartment. I'm not in a position to say what is happening, reiterated Shuri. Fine then, said Murdoch as he resumed his work. I have to deal with this, call me if you need anything, said Shuri. All right, said Jennifer as she flipped through a document. The mood didn't sit well with Shuri. She put it down to her inexperience working with Jennifer. Shuri left with the ambassador and they went to the security control room. The outside security cameras monitored the Avengers and the military units outside of the embassy. Why would they waste all these resources to lock down an embassy, pondered Shuri. Look at this, said the ambassador. Shuri turned to the system that watched the sewers underneath the embassy. US military droids were in the tunnels as guards. This is overkill, muttered Shuri. Excuse me, said the ambassador. They have us on lockdown because of our spy network. They swept Matt and Jennifer's places just in case we had dumped anything by the two, said Shuri. There is also a teleportation barrier around the building, said a security analyst. That means Tichala and Ororo can't get back, said Shuri. She took out her Kamoyo and called her brother, but got no answer. She tried for Ororo and received the same result. I'm on my own, thought Shuri. Her guilt came back and that mixed with the anger that Claw lied in court. Out of the confusion in her brain, she managed to order that calm be maintained in the embassy and that no one should interact with the outside forces. Should we call the US Foreign Affairs Department and make a formal complaint, asked the ambassador. Do that, replied Shuri. I'll be in the main office awaiting contact with Ororo and Tichella. In the office, Shuri watched the satellite surveillance over Erkgistan that was obscured by thick clouds. Will things always be like this, she wondered. Shuri called her mother to update the woman on the situation. Then Shuri contacted the press officer to give a statement. She looked at the security monitors and she saw Captain America, Thor, Iron Man, Ms. Marvel, Vision, Henry Pym, Black Widow and Spider-Man. The Avengers had completely surrounded the building. Imagine one rash act could have such a snowball effect, said Shuri. Her kamoyo rang and she was glad to see that it was Tichala who was calling her. Tichala, she said on answering the kamoyo. Shuri how are things? Not too good. The embassy is on lockdown. The Avengers are here. Matt and Jennifer's apartments were raided, replied Shuri. You and Aurora's freedom of movement in the US has been curtailed. I don't know when that freeze will be lifted. How are you and Aurora? A bit beaten up, said Tichella. The mission was a success though. Are you coming back over? We were at this very minute, but this new development has to be dealt with, replied Tichella. Do Matt and Jennifer know the reason? I left that for you responded Shuri. All right. Ororo and I will try to make the trial, if not then you're on your own, said Tichella. Not a problem, said Shuri. 
Okay, put me onto Matt and Jennifer, said Tichala. Chapter 3 Tichala glanced over to Aurora as she spoke with the White House to arrange a phone meeting with Bowlinger. Tichala heard Matt's voice on the Kamoyo and he turned on the device's video screen. I want to speak with you and Jen alone, said Tichala. Give us a minute, said Murdoch. He saw Murdoch instruct the assistants to leave the room. Jennifer joined Murdoch in front of the video phone. This is the situation. Wakanda's spy network in the United States has been discovered and it has been shut down. I believe the reason for the lockdown on the embassy was to ensure we did nothing about the network and to send a message of how tough the administration was on this issue, said Tichala. Spy network, said Murdoch. I'm surprised and not at the same time. Are we talking here about Chinese-like espionage on military projects? It was for surveillance purposes, said Tichala. Are you coming for the rest of the trial, asked Jennifer. Aurora and I will speak with President Bowlinger and we'll see what happens from there, replied Tichala. And what is the reason for the raids on our homes, asked Murdoch. The government is being thorough with the investigations so they'll look into our associates. Even Aurora's grandparents were raided, responded Tichella. How is the analyst of the Claw testimony coming along? Cold, replied Murdoch. It is so carefully worded that we can't get around it. Have you told Shuri, asked Tichella. Not yet, replied Jennifer. Then we are depending on Aurora's plan from here on, said Tichella. Seems like it, said Jennifer. We can also delay the trial by filing an injunction, said Murdoch. That will buy us some time. Aurora signaled to Tichella to wrap up his call. Okay we'll call if anything new occurs, said Tichella, and he ended the link. He rolled on his chair over to Aurora. Bowlinger will be with us shortly, said Aurora, as she leaned back in her chair. You know, Shuri may run if she is found guilty, said Tichella. And cause another diplomatic row, said Aurora. Also she doesn't want our help without her permission, said Tichella. Tichella, frankly speaking, she is going to need our help in the future, it is the nature of our relationship with her. I didn't expect the trial would cross over into these other events, said Tichella. The universe is a marvel, honey, said Aurora. Cause and effect rules it. Bowlinger appeared on the video monitor. Tichella observed that the man looked exhausted. The national leaders exchanged greetings and then got on with the business at hand. I see that you're not in the embassy, said Bowlinger. We left before the lockdown, said Aurora. And attacked a US weapon, stated Bowlinger. Let's get one thing clear no one is above the laws of the US. We understand that, said Tichella. As you are aware of, a spy network with links to Wakanda has been discovered in my country. Due to the extensive size and technological complexity of the spy network you will be debarred from the US until we see fit to reinstate your privileges, said Bowlinger. Is that definitive enough? Tichella restrained himself. It's perfectly clear, said Aurora. Good day. Afterwards, the couple went to the second phase of Aurora's plan. Tichala went to the central hospital to collect Silver Sable while Aurora contacted the father. When Tichala arrived at the hospital, the blonde-haired Silver Sable was still in a coma. Prepare her for air transport, Tichala ordered the doctors. Aurora called him with the news that Ernst Sablanova would see them. That's great, said Tichala. Silver Sable was carried to Tichala's hover plane that was on the hospital's roof. Tichala then flew the plane to his house and he picked up Aurora. Then the couple headed for Simkaria. Sablanova wanted to meet in his home that overlooked the border with Latveria. As the plane flew over the area, 
Tichala wasn't surprised that Sablanova lived in a splendid mansion. The rangy Nazi hunter waited near the helipad for the visitors as they landed. Tichala and Ororo didn't take Silver Sable off the plane when they disembarked. You have finally returned my daughter. Her uncles will be pleased, said Sablanova. Actually we want to advise you about not telling anyone of Sable's return, said Ororo. Tichala looked on as his wife negotiated a difficult situation. What do you mean? asked Sablanova. It was Sable who murdered David Cross Skill. She had evidence that he ordered the elimination of scores of people who were in his company's way. Shuri had taken the blame in the hope Sable would have awakened by now, but that hasn't happened and Shuri may very well end up being convicted, replied Ororo. So what do you want? asked an agitated Sablanova. That you declare Sable legally dead, responded Ororo. Sablanova was stunned into silence. He looked at Tichala and then back to Ororo. For what reason? Sablanova managed to convey. We had to give up Sable for Shuri to have a chance of going free. With Sable declared dead then the US authorities cannot charge her for the murder, responded Ororo. Sablanova was visibly vexed. Let me see her, he demanded. The couple took him inside the plane's infirmary. Sable rested on a medical bed. Sablanova kissed her forehead and he held her hand. Who did this to her? he asked in a calmer manner. If I tell you promise not to go after them. Like I said that will just complicate matters more, said Ororo. Who? asked Sablanova. It was a robot called the Mistek Soldier, replied Tichala. We have learned that the current head of Blackwaters sent the weapon after your daughter. I'm guessing you have a plan to avenge my daughter, said Sablanova with tears in his eyes. One way or the other he will get his due, said Tichala. That's not good enough for me. I want to know that the bastard is going to pay dearly, said Sablanova. You will have to trust us, said Ororo. I need time to decide, said Sablanova. Time is of the essence. We even have a place to hide Sable, said Tichala. Sablanova glared at him. Chapter 4 The White House, Washington, D.C. The President's study was where Bowlinger met privately with the Secretary of Defense and the Attorney General. The Secretary of Defense played a new taped conversation between Nolan and Hathaway that further implicated the two men in a cover-up. Bowlinger looked at his Attorney General Wayne Watson. The President knew that the man was absorbing the information and working out the legal details in his mind. The tape ended and the President wanted advice. What does this mean for the Shuri case? asked Bowlinger. Watson locked the fingers on both hands together and placed them under his chin. Then he stood and placed his hands to the sides. The case will have to be thrown out based on this evidence, replied Watson. And this silver sable will have to stand trial. What about Claw? I signed the law that made his testimony possible, said Bowlinger. Claw may not have committed perjury if that is what you are alluding to, said Watson. Shuri may have been an accomplice or she was indeed there but in another capacity. Well then everything can be settled in a neat and tidy fashion. Get the extradition order for Silver Sable as soon as possible, said Bowlinger. Yes. Mr. President, said Watson. And take this, said Bowlinger as he handed the tape over to Watson. One question though, said the Secretary of Defense. How did the Wakandans know that the Mistek soldier attacked Silver Sable? And were they withholding that information deliberately from the trial? Watson, said Bowlinger. Can the same charges of withholding evidence be brought on them? The Attorney General went over the question in his head and then spoke. We have no proof of that, Watson replied. What a pity, said Bowlinger. Well that concludes this meeting. The three men walked into the adjacent Oval Office. 
the Secretary of Defense turned on his mobile and saw he had several messages. One of the messages dealt with Silver Sable and he opened it. Mr. President, sir, said the Secretary of Defense. Yes, said Bowlinger. I just received a notification that Silver Sable has been declared dead, said the Secretary of Defense. I will have to confirm that with my Foreign Secretary, said Bowlinger as he walked briskly to his desk. He made a quick call while he gestured for Watson to stay. Bowlinger got the information he needed and hanged up. It's true, said Bowlinger. So nobody is going to pay for murdering David Cross Skill. Amazing. This may be too coincidental. I advise that that we verify for ourselves, said the Secretary of Defense. Do it, said Bowlinger. Mr. President can I have a private word with you, asked Watson. Sure, said Bowlinger. The Secretary of Defense left and Bowlinger sat at his desk. Watson kept standing. What's on your mind, asked Bowlinger. I just want to remind you about the separation of powers. I think that you have come too close to this murder trial, said Watson. I understand your point, said Bowlinger. I'm only looking out for the welfare of this country's citizens. Yes, but the justice that you seek is a matter for the courts, not the executive, said Watson. I will have to document my meeting here with you and the Secretary of Defense. That's not a problem. Everything has been above board as far as I understand, said Bowlinger. All right then, I will speak with the trial judge, said Watson. Good night Mr. President. Good night, Watson, said Bowlinger. After the Attorney General departed Bowlinger looked at the grounds through his window. Maybe Watson was right that I did get too close to this trial, thought Bowlinger. He had wanted Shuri convicted to set a precedent because of the secret report he had of several foreigners who had murdered US citizens in America and due to diplomatic technicalities the murderers remained free. Shuri's trial would have been a landmark case that would set the tone for years to come. Where is the justice in the world, muttered Bowlinger. Chapter 5 Murdoch, Jennifer and the state lawyer David Stagler were called to the judge's chamber at the Superior Court. Judge Randolph was equally bemused as was Stagler by the new evidence that came like a thief in the night. I will instruct the jury to return a not guilty verdict, said Randolph. Fine with me, said Stagler. Thank you sir, said Murdoch. Minutes later, the trial resumed and Stagler rested his case. Murdoch and Jennifer ended their defense. Then Randolph instructed the jury to return a not guilty verdict much to the surprise of the gallery. The judge brought order back to the court that erupted in murmurs. He stated that new evidence had arisen so the case needed to be dismissed. The jury then went to the jury room. Shuri kept in contact with Tichala and Ororo as she waited in the court for the jury to return. A sense of relief was in her legal team. Murdoch and Jennifer even chatted with the veteran Stagler as they waited. The jury returned with the verdict and everyone filed back into the courtroom. Randolph had his mind on other matters as the legal formalities played out. Has the jury reached a verdict? Randolph asked. Yes, said the jury for person. The jury has found the defendant Shuri guilty of all charges. What? asked Randolph in anger. The sentiment was echoed around the courtroom. Shuri held Jennifer's arm. How can this be? asked the young woman. This has never happened before, said Jennifer as she stood. Randolph was furious. What nonsense is this? he demanded. To his annoyance the four-person repeated the verdict. Yet Randolph had to follow procedure before he could find a way to undo the mess. Take Shuri into custody, said Randolph and he pointed his gavel at the jury. You all will answer for this. Chapter 6 Shuri's nightmare came true as the officer walked over to her. 
she could have easily eluded him and bolted to the door that Judge passed through. Murdoch tried to calm her. She thought about Tichala and Ororo and that stopped her from escaping. The officer asked Shuri to raise her hands for the manacles. The situation was so unreal for her. Call Tichala, Shuri said to Murdoch. Don't worry. We will deal with this, said Murdoch. Shuri was escorted out of the courtroom and she was handed over to the Thunderbolts.